Hi, my name is Bryce Edward Brown, and if you've recently been exposed to invaulted hulls entombed, then you may be suffering from common love, death, and robot side effects, like confusion from lack of context, existential crises, watching the ending of the episode and going like, what? Well, let me tell you this, buddy. You may be entitled to my in-depth explanation and analysis, so... Let's get started. In Vaulted Halls Entombed is an episode that's part of Love, Death, and Robots Volume 3. But if you were to ask me, it's really part of Love, Death, and Robots Volume 2, because I'm one of those people. Regardless, this episode is based on the original short story of the same name written by Alan Baxter. You can find this specific short story in his book called Served Cold. Throughout this video, I'm going to be referencing the original short story to give you some more of that sweet, raw, unadulterated context. So, you know, you can better understand what in the f*** you just watched. Watched. Harper. Our main protagonist over here was originally named Lance Corporal Paul Brown and was a man in the original short story. But for the sake of preventing everyone from getting a headache, I'm gonna combine these two names into Harper and I'm gonna refer to Harper as a woman because they are the same person. So Brown in the book is now Harper. Great, now that we established that, we can move on with our lives. In this episode, we focus on Sergeant Colthard and a squad of soldiers pursuing a group of insurgents somewhere deep in the mountains of Afghanistan. The mission is to rescue soldiers who were taken hostage by these insurgents. But sadly, the insurgents decided to hide out in a cave that led to an ancient hellscape we'll refer to as the Cavern of Doom. In the original short story, the squad is mainly pursuing the insurgents not because they took hostages, but because of their body count, as in the soldiers that they killed. Also, in the short story, Colthard was way more emotionless and got carried away with his pursuit, which led them further into the cave. But we're not going to talk about that as much, I just thought it was worth noting. Harper comes across some lichen on the wall that's glowing just bright enough to illuminate the cave. The lichen is scattered in random cracks and fissures, with the occasional large patch like the one Harper pulls a sample from. Okay, but here's where it gets moderately interesting. Remember that Love, Death, and Robots episode, Blade Runner 24, I mean, uh, Pop Squad? In the original short story of Pop Squad, Detective Briggs claims that the clear liquid that they used in the Riju Clinic should have been green. Then, in the Love, Death, and Robots episode, they took what was supposed to be a clear liquid and made it you guessed it. Green. They made it green. And blue. But that doesn't help my point as much. They ended up doing the same thing in the episode in Vaulted Holes Entombed. In the original short story, Harper claims that she's heard of that kind of stuff, as in the lichen, but always thought it was green. Then in the adaptation, they ended up making it the color green. But to be fair, they ended up making most of the other lichen in the cave blue, as well as making the glowing insides of the spiders blue, as well as making the ancient symbols in the cavern blue, which is pretty accurate to the short story. The glowing light and while very dim, gives off enough light for the soldiers to use their night vision goggles when they're that far down in the cave. When continuing this very fun journey down a corridor almost as dark as the inner workings of my soul, they come across some bones. Harper, being the medic of the group, is told to check out the skeleton laying on the floor. When examining Mr. Bones over here, she finds that it's an adult male with no discerning marks of trauma that she could see at first glance. The skeleton was warm and too clean to be rotted. In the short story, the skeleton was wrapped in streaks of blue lichen, kind of like snail trails. That's mainly due to the fact that the tunnel monsters in the short story weren't creepy spiders. In the short story, it's the huge gelatinous blob that's chasing the soldiers and melting their flesh away, leaving behind a gel-like viscous icor that was clear and odorless. The soldiers' flashlights actually ended up slowing the blob creature down. They couldn't really destroy it, so their flashlights ended up being more useful than their weapons, bullets, grenades, etc. It appears that the army of spiders have all the traits of the blob, except for, of course, being a blob. The light from the tower at the center of the cavern is what prevented the blob from going outside of the cave. So it's safe to make the assumption that in this episode, the light from the tower is what stopped those baby spiders from leaving the cave, which is really unfortunate for Dillman, as the spiders must have hopped off of him when he reached the light of the cavern, but he reached that light a little bit too late. Sarge was definitely right when he told Harper that there was nothing she could do for him. Like the fact that I have to blur out Dillman to preserve what's left of the monetization on this video is a pretty good indication that he was just beyond saving. When hanging out in the Cavern of Doom, the soldiers encounter these bigger spiders that are each about a meter tall and a meter wide. They appear to be the adult versions of what we saw in the cave. In the short story, the creatures are described as rolling black water, scrambling on too many legs, black bodies like scorpions, but where the stinger should be on the end of the wagging tail was a leering face. Almost human, though twisted somehow into something hideously uncanny. Well, they definitely got the face right, I'll tell you that. There must be 
be something about the way the bigger scorpion spider things age that allow them to tolerate the light from within the cavern. Or they never age, and the only reason the cave spiders can't enter the cavern is because it's not their jurisdiction. In the short story, Colthard is the one to suggest that the creatures in the cave are the guards of the tunnel. The creatures that we encounter in the cave and in the cavern are there to guard anyone from accessing the tower, and potentially freeing the nightmare monster imprisoned in the center of the tower. Oh yeah, and speaking of the cavern housing this monster, Harper, Colthard, and Spencer reach this massive cavern that has ceilings hundreds of meters tall. At the center of the cavern is a monumental structure emitting a glow that would deter those quote-unquote cannibal roaches from entering the cavern. The tower is surrounded by statues with forearms that resemble something close to what the monster looks like. In the short story, it's said that each step on the staircase is about two meters high, but it looks like they doubled the height of each step in this adaptation, making it look more like like it's designed for this massive creature inside of it, or possibly the ones who placed it there. Harper spots a tunnel that appears to be 50 meters wide and is the clear choice when choosing an exit. This door is probably where the insurgents were headed before Colthard over here 360 no scope them. In order to get Spencer to snap out of it, Harper had to tell him that God is dead and to embrace the suck. In this adaptation, they added the fact that Spencer was religious. In the short story, the only connection that Spence had to religion was that his wife was spiritual and it's said that his wife had a strong feeling that something bad was going to happen to him. Not that he would die, but that he would come back horribly injured. And when freaking the freak out, Spencer went on to remind the sergeant that he has a son turning two years old next month, and that he's due home just in time for his son's birthday, as he was supposed to go home in two weeks. Which is so, so unfortunate that his wife ended up being wrong. Okay, speaking of gods, let's address the big ol' scary doomsday monster in the center of the ancient cavern. What is this? A lot of people were saying it's Cthulhu, but I don't think it's Cthulhu. So Doug Audie approached me and said, we're going to do this thing. It's got Cthulhu in it. And I said, I'm in. Okay, it's Cthulhu. Animation supervisor Craig McPherson has confirmed it. It's never specified what exactly the monster looks like in the short story, but when creating this adaptation, I guess they decided to make it Cthulhu. This is the first time I've seen Cthulhu with four arms and 12 eyes. But enough with those extremely exciting details. I'm getting ahead of myself here. For those who aren't in the know, Cthulhu is a cosmic entity created by H.P. Lovecraft, which is actually not the first H.P. Lovecraft reference I've seen in this show. I swear that the guy from the tall grass is modeled after the actual person who was H.P. Lovecraft. Look at them. Look at them! Cthulhu is an immortal creature, which is why it's kept in this prison, because certain entities can contain it, but they couldn't kill it. It's interesting that in this adaptation, Cthulhu is contained in a mountain chain in Afghanistan. In H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Call of Cthulhu, it's said that in his house at Rillie, dead Cthulhu waits streaming. Rillie is the location at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, where you can find a hideous monolith crown citadel where Cthulhu is entombed. Kind of like how he's entombed in this tower right here. So this is the the geographical location of where Cthulhu's original house was, and here's where they decided to put it for invaulted holes entombed. Cthulhu is a massive creature that has wings, an octopus for a face, the ability to cause an apocalypse, and also comes with telepathic communication. It's said that if someone gazes upon Cthulhu, they will be driven to the point of insanity, which is essentially what happens to Harper and Colthard in the short story and in the LDR episode. At the end of the episode, we see Harper walking alone in the desert, and this is just a guess, but I'm I'm assuming that she made it out of the cavern. I have subtitles going every moment of my life because I needed to hear the dialogue, so when looking at the subtitles of what Harper is saying during this ending scene, it just appears Harper whispering an alien language. Which really is as disappointing as like turning on your subtitles when someone is speaking in a language like French, and then they have the audacity to put speaking in French at the bottom of your screen, and you're just like... I feel cheated. Unless you actually speak French. In that case, it's just a normal Tuesday. At the end of the original short story, Colonel Adam Leonard created a special statement saying that they found Harper seven kilometers from the cave that we saw her entering at the beginning of the episode. Harper's left arm below the elbow was just bone, meaning that she escaped the tunnel guardians, but clearly suffered from some injuries. Harper was most likely only able to make it out with the use of a flashlight because she wouldn't let go of it. When Harper was finally found, she kept repeating the phrase 
never let it out, never let it out, referring to our boy Cthulhu. We clearly saw that Harper and Colthard's eyes were affected by whatever spell Cthulhu was casting over them. It's very possible that in order to prevent herself from releasing the cosmic entity and destroying the world, she used what was left of her willpower to cut her own eyes out. How she managed to escape to the surface with no eyesight is still unknown, but the fact that she's still whispering these alien phrases means that she's still somewhat under the control of Cthulhu and was driven to the point of insanity from looking at it. And like Harper from the short story, she's definitely not going to recover from it. But in the end, she still prevented Cthulhu from getting out and destroying everything that we hold dear. So in my opinion, it's a pretty happy ending. Mm -hmm.